Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Creating Customer-Centric Messaging for Optimal Lead Generation. Special thanks today to ActOn for sponsoring the webinar and for giving us some insights into how marketers can use marketing automation to improve their lead gen marketing efforts, which we'll be discussing later in the presentation. My name is Justin Breidigan, and I'm here with Marketing Sherpa broadcasting live from our Mech Lab studio here in Jacksonville, Florida. Now, I'll be the host today to get us started, and John Hozier and Will Duke, our webinar team, will be monitoring the questions and doing the polling for us. We only have 60 minutes today. We have tons of content, so let's go ahead and get started. I'll introduce to you our expert speakers. First, we have Jen Doyle. She is the Senior Research Manager at Mech Labs and the author of six Marketing Sherpa publications, including the 2012 Lead Generation Benchmark Report and, of course, the 2011 and 2012 editions of the B2B Marketing Benchmark Report. She's also a trainer at Marketing Sherpa Workshops and a speaker at our Marketing Sherpa upcoming B2B Summit and Partner Events. Jen, it's great to have you with us. Thanks, Justin. It's great to be here. No problem. Stoney Clark is a research associate with Marketing Sherpa. Initially an optimization researcher in Mech Lab Services team, Stoney joined forces with us here in 2011 so she can merge some of those insights from her applied work into marketing and her academic studies in cultural anthropology. Now she is experienced in qualitative and quantitative research methods with a focus on digital media, and she strives to translate her learnings into consumable resources to help marketers like everyone on the call today. Stoney, it's great to have you with us as well. Thanks, Justin. I'm glad to be here too. All right. So we're all started. I want to encourage everyone to join our conversation on Twitter today by using hashtag Sherpa webinar. And we also, you can join us by filling out the question box in the left-hand corner. John and Will will be monitoring those questions during the presentation. And just so you know, we will be sending all attendees a copy of this presentation following the broadcast today. Now let's go ahead and get started, tell you a little bit about Marketing Sherpa and our webinar process. Now I've been asked this question before and I think it's really important. What really separates Marketing Sherpa webinars from most? And really the difference is between the depth and the analysis that you're going to receive on key topics that really affect marketers like yourself. So we're going to go beyond the theory and we're going to give you proven results that are backed by research. So our goal here at Marketing Sherpa is to provide you with the most up-to-date research using those best practice tactics for really improving your marketing performance. And we do this by interviewing and surveying thousands of marketers, and they help us find out what works and what doesn't. And that really yields our targeted benchmark guides and how-to handbooks. So we take that knowledge, and then we teach marketers how to apply those best practices with webinars like this one, and also certification trainings coming to a city near you. And we also have our upcoming B2B Summit uh, next week in Orlando, Florida. And really this is an ongoing cycle that is really fueled by your feedback. So as we grow together, these are things that we participate, we encourage each other to learn more about the marketing community and to grow. And the research we're going to be presenting today is from feedback from yourself. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to cover today in this agenda. First, we're going to cover the introduction and really the background of the fuel methodology. And then we're going to build that foundation really for your own lead generation programs. We're going to go through some of the buyer personas and how you can improve your relevance and your own engagement. We're going to do that by covering some of the marketing Sherpa case studies on how you can really combine your email, your search, your social, and really your content to help your marketing campaigns. And we're going to follow that up with some key strategies that can help you develop valuable in-demand content. So with that, Jen, I'm going to turn it over to you to help us get started today. Thank you so much, Justin. I'm really excited to be here to share this brand new content with you guys. Um, just a little housekeeping note, uh, Justin or John, my slides aren't advancing, so I'm going to need you guys to advance the slides for me. Appreciate that. Uh, but for now, we're going to talk about the research background. So we conducted several studies in, on B2B and lead generation, as Justin mentioned, and we've actually surveyed over 3,000 marketers to discuss these topics. And we really uncovered their top challenges, um, top strategies and tactics to solving those challenges. We, looked, uh, we took a deep dive into lead scoring, nurturing, and management with marketing automation, and looking at content as well, which is so important. But what I really want to get to is the fact that the result of this research is our fuel method 
methodology that will really power marketing effectiveness from lead generation all the way through to sales conversion. So let's take a look at the next slide talking about our key finding, the fact that challenges are still growing. So what we're looking at here on this slide, see this red line as it increases year over year from 2009 to 2010 to 2011. What we're looking at here is the average indication of B2B challenges. And as you can see, they're growing and growing. Looking at challenges like lead quality and lead volume, um, we're also having a more complex sale. We're looking at more individuals involved in the buying process. And it's taking longer for our buyers to make their purchasing decisions. And really, it's just becoming more and more difficult out there for B2B marketers and lead generation specialists. So let's take a look at the next slide looking at the growing challenges facing B2B marketers. So this is, a, this is providing more detail on the previous slide that we looked at. So you can see the actual indications of the challenges like generating high quality leads, our number one challenge, um, generating a volume of leads. You can see how these are still increasing year over year. It's just becoming more and more difficult. So on the next slide, what has caused these challenges? There are really internal and external influencers at play here. Of course, you know we're facing a, a tough economy, and this is creating a skeptical buyer who is a little bit more reluctant to let go of that budget, right? We also have social media and search engines at play where buyers can access a breadth of information about us online before they even talk to our sales teams, and they can learn about us through their peers. And I hate to say it, but that that any word from their peers or that they're reading online is probably going to be a little bit more trusted um, than what's coming directly from the company. So the market has really changed, and we need to adapt to it. But that's our other, our other factor here, our internal factor. Um, on the next slide, we're looking at the fact that B2B marketers are resistant to change. Uh, our research indicates that B2B marketers are really reluctant to adapt some of the new best practices that are really required to a market and convert this new empowered buyer. So for example, uh, do you send all leads directly to sales on the next slide? We see that 61% of organizations are actually sending all leads to sales directly. Um, so in fact, only 27% of those leads will be qualified and ready to go to sales. So not everyone wants to go to sales right away. You know, they have search engines and social media sites to do their research, and they don't need to engage. And sending them to sales before they're ready could potentially ruin your option to close that lead down the line. Our next practice we're looking at, have you defined your sales and marketing funnel? The majority of marketers, 68% surveyed, have not identified their funnel. And this is a problem because before you can really optimize a lead's progression through the funnel stages, you have to map out what that path looks like first. So it's a critical first step uh, to sales optimization. Finally, we're looking at do you score and nurture your leads? Again, no big surprise here. We're seeing a trend. We're having the majority, 79%, not scoring their leads yet. And the majority, again, 65% are not nurturing their leads. So again, this is another big problem because we're seeing these buyers that aren't immediately ready to go to sales. We need to score them to determine whether or not they're ready. And for those who are not ready, we need to nurture them as well in order to move them through the buying funnel. So how can we really combat these new challenges that we're looking at? Well, that's precisely why we developed the FUEL methodology, and I'm going to talk about each step here for you. So the first step here, again, this is the result of our research of over 3,000 marketers over three years of research. And so the first step, we're looking at finding and attracting leads. So in this step, you really have to build your foundation for your lead generation programs by establishing buyer personas, building content, and really getting ready and defining your segments. Then you have to master essential lead generation. This, of course, is your lead generation tactics that you're looking at, your inbound tactics, your outbound tactics, integration of all of these tactics, really finding a good mix that's going to generate that optimal quality and quantity of leads that you need. The next step is to uncover qualified leads. So once you get all of this lead volume coming through the funnel, you need to assess who's ready for sales, who's not, who needs to be nurtured. And that's really where we get into all of the scoring and nurturing processes. In order to do all of this, we do recommend automation, which is the third step of the field methodology. Um, so you can automate these practices of scoring and nurturing. 
And finally, you want to list results as the last step. You always want to be measuring, optimizing, testing all aspects of your funnel. So let's get into the first topic, which is building the foundation of your lead generation programs. So who are you targeting? We really need to identify buyer personas. And what is a buyer persona? Why do we need it? Essentially, it allows you to create content that's going to be really targeted, really relevant to a small group of individuals in your target market that have common interests common goals, common expectations, other commonalities. And it's really the difference of sending one message out to a wide and vast and varied audience and sending a very targeted message out to that one segment of your group. So it's very important. It can be really effective. Um, it really increases engagement and conversion and relevance and all the things that your buyers really want because it really can't be everything to everybody. So that's why you have to identify buyer personas and start segmenting your content for your lead generation. So exactly what is a buyer persona? We're going to look at the definition here on this slide. It's really a detailed profile that represents an actual real-life group of your target audience. It includes common interests, motivations, and expectations, as well as demographic and other behavioral characteristics. So the important thing here is you're looking at, of course, those demographics that everybody knows, the industry vertical, the company size, but you also have to get into um, those behavioral characteristics. What's really making those buyers tick at those various verticals and those various organization sizes? You know, what are their motivations for purchase? What are their concerns about buying your product or service? Um, you know, what, are they, what are they interested in in terms of the content that they want to download? So all of these things, it's very important to balance behavioral characteristics with those demographics that we're also familiar with. So one question I get a lot when I, when I teach this concept of buyer personas in our, in our workshops so isn't that the same thing as target market? So I want to address that now because they are two different things. The target market is represented by that, that picture I have there of all of those people. It's the wide and varied audience. Um, it includes demographics um, such as location or company size, but it doesn't really take into account those behavioral characteristics that are really going to make, help you identify the content that's going to really resonate with those buyer personas. So let's take a look at top tactics in developing buyer personas. So we asked as part of our lead generation and B2B marketing benchmark study, um, what were the top tactics that they used, marketers used, for developing their buyer personas? So of course the top tactic is going straight to the source. Um, Marketers indicated that interviewing prospects and our customers was highly effective. Also interviewing sales. you know. Customer-facing departments like sales and customer service can be really great resources here because they're talking to your buyers and your customers all day, and they have a lot of great insight into what makes them tick. So go straight to the source. Talk to your customer-facing departments. Um, you can even get quantitative and conduct a survey of your prospects or customers, just a simple survey you could email out to them. But you want to collect all of this data, and we're going to give you more tips um, and more steps in how you conduct that later on in this presentation. But first let's take a look at some key buyer persona traits. As I mentioned, you really have to balance demographics and behaviors to get a really good idea of what's going on with your buyer personas and your market out there. Uh, so some demographics you can consider are job title and responsibility. You know, this can be um, indicative of what type of content that individual is going to want to receive. Certainly a specialist would want different types of content than a CMO. Um, organization size or department size is going to help drive your decisions. Primary market, of course, industry, location, budget, all of these are great demographic traits that you could collect from your lead on the landing page. You can say, you know, what is your title? What is your organization size? And then you can plug those demographics right into your CRM. So you also want to consider the behavior is very important. Um, what are their key concerns for purchase? What, what are they worried about? Is their job riding on this decision? What are their interests, motivations, and expectations for buying this product or service? Um, what is their decision-making authority? Or do they have the final say? Or are there several levels of approval that they have to go through in order to make this purchase? Um, is there any urgency here? Or are they kind of lagging in their decision? What are their goals? Do they have familiarity with your product or service? 
is or is there a level of education that has to go on there? So all of these behavioral traits can really help you develop content that's going to help convert those leads and help progress them through the sales and marketing funnel. So it's very important things to consider. You can find out these traits, like we said, by going straight to the source, asking your prospects and customers, or talking to your customer facing departments as well can really help you here. So here on the next slide, we have um, a grid here. Again, you guys are all going to receive these slides. This is really a template that you can use going forward to help plot out your ideal customers and the personas that you think you have going on in your market. Usually there's about four. So on the next slide, let's talk about how you can go about researching your buyer personas. You want to make sure that your research is both qualitative and quantitative. So we're going to talk about what that means here. As I mentioned, talk to your customer-facing departments. Ask sales about the motivations, um, the barriers, the expectations. What's going on with those sales? You know, what objections are they constantly overcoming? Um, talk to customer service about, you know, were these buyers' expectations met by our product or service? Um, what were those expectations? How were we in meeting their needs? And be sure to ask when you're talking to sales and customer service, who are our best customers or prospects, and who are our worst customers or prospects? Because you're going to want to distinguish between these two groups later on in the process. Um, and they'll be able to tell you. They will know. So you ask sales who's the best prospect, who's the worst prospect. The key difference might mean you know, the difference of budget, um, the difference of deal size, the difference of time to close. Um, customer service will know because you're happy customers. You know, they'll make repeat purchases. They'll make referrals, um, whereas the unhappy customers might go and talk bad about you on social media sites. Um, they might try to ask for a refund or something like that. So make sure you distinguish between these two groups. Of course, we mentioned you want to go straight to the source like, was, um, like we saw in that that graph there, the chart, it was the top tactic, talking to your prospects and your customers. Make sure you do these interviews and make sure you interview both your best and worst prospects. Again, you're going to want to make sure you're identifying what the differences are there. You're going to want to attract more of your best prospects and less of your worst prospects. So let's take a look at how you can get quantitative with this research of your buyer personas. Another top tactic that we saw in that chart was actually getting quantitative and conducting a survey. Um, we can, that, of course, is a great tactic. You can also mine your in-house database. Um, you should be able to run reports on your most profitable customers, your least profitable customers, um, your customers who made returns, your customers who bought quickly, things like that. And you can look for your common traits and common um, Whatever demographic you can download there from your in-house database, any commonalities you can identify there. I have a couple sample buyer personas here on the next slide for you, just to give you guys a level of um, understanding on the detail that you want to go into when you're looking at these buyer personas. So for this company, their ideal customer is the B2C retailer with ample resources in-house. That sounds like everybody's ideal customer to me. Um, they're seeking a comprehensive platform to deploy promotional emails to a large list of over 100,000 contacts. Um, I should have mentioned this is for an email service provider, hypothetical email service provider. Uh, their ideal customer tends to have a solution in place, but they're seeking a more in-depth product. Their organization has over 500 employees. Um, again, that's speaking to the approximate deal size. That might lend to budget. Uh, this buyer gets it and has a clear understanding and value of the benefits for the product. That's a very important indication here. Um, there's not a great level of education that has to happen in order to move this buyer forward and help them to see the value. So this buyer has ample resources, both financial and departmental. Of course, again, everyone's ideal customer, right? So let's look at this example of the worst customer for the same hypothetical company. The small business owner with limited marketing resources and experience. Um, this buyer thinks email marketing should be inexpensive. They want to deploy a list to, uh, messages. Their list is less than 10,000 subscribers. Again, we're looking at low deal size here, low education, low value for the product. Um, the buyer is relatively unfamiliar with the benefits of the product over their current free email system. So you can see the dramatic differences before this ideal customer and worst customer. 
So on the next slide, we actually have another quadrant here. You guys could use this as a template as well once you get the slide deck, which marketing will send to you post-webinar. So when you plot your buyer persona quadrant, so you've talked to your ideal customers, you've talked to your worst customers, you should be able to identify two, at least two key differentiations between these two groups. Um, try to focus on the top two. So if, for example, on the sample that we looked at, the real difference was potential deal size and education understanding of the key benefits, right? So our ideal customer, we've plotted those on the axis. So the ideal customer is in the top right axis. Um, because they meet both of these qualifications, great. Uh, everything is great. They have potential deal size, which is high. They have a high level of understanding and value. So they go in the top right. And then the worst customer is going in the bottom left for the same reason. They do not meet the potential deal size very well. They do not have a level of understanding. And then usually there's a couple different personas that fall somewhere in between. Um, they have a good deal size but low education. They have a high education but low deal size, for example. So that's how you're going to want to plot your buyer persona quadrant. And this is going to be a great tool for you to roll out your, your personas um, and help them become part of your company culture, help your marketing team understand them, help your sales team understand them, and get everybody on board. So at this time, we're ready to move forward and start talking about we have a great case study for you in which a company really combined email search and social media and PR for a content marketing campaign. But they also took this step of research, which I want you to see how they did this, um, because it was really an important aspect of creating a compelling piece of content. Um, so at this time, Stoney is going to present the case study for you guys. And Stoney, you can go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Jen. Okay, so this case study is about how Suitcase.com, an online luggage retailer, used existing marketing channels and content to attract a relevant audience and drive blog traffic. Um, the marketing team at Suitcase.com wanted to drive more traffic to the company blog in order to A, establish thought leadership and authority, and B, educate customers on product selection. However, the team didn't really want to spend a bunch more money on advertising. So instead they decided to take advantage of some of the existing marketing channels and assets that they weren't really using to their full potential. Okay, so the team came up with a multi-channel campaign that combined insights from search marketing and the reach of public relations, email, and social media. They began research campaign by looking at search volumes for industry specific keywords. And this, they discovered several trends in suitcase-related searches. For one, they saw that a lot of people were looking up terms like um, baggage restrictions and travel bags. And the popular search term suggested that people were frustrated with airport luggage restrictions and searching for more information on the topic. Now, realizing this could be a great point to report on, they began to search competitor sites for similar content, and fortunately found that no one else had really addressed these issues in the previous research, and decided to go forward with this topic. Okay, so the team built a survey addressing each areas they found during their preliminary research. Then they sent out the survey to their house list. Now, these were individuals who were already interested in luggage, so they made great subject study. A CEO, John Ebb, told us, um, the team made sure that people they sent the survey to were already interested in luggage, and not just people to fill out surveys. Still, as incentive, they offered respondents an opportunity to win a free dinner for two. Once the survey closed, the team compiled its results into a nine-page report um, that included a cover page, a table of contents, an executive summary with methodology and key findings, colorful charts and statistics, um, analyses and quotes from the team, and descriptions of each of the companies involved. Now the team created journalist-friendly content by focusing on the data and analyses rather than focusing on promoting the brand. So they didn't promote the report through regular avenues. Instead, they strove to increase search visibility by attracting press mentions and external links. And the key here was to pitch the idea to partners in a context that was relevant to their audiences. So for instance, the team couldn't have asked its PR agency to blog about the travel report's findings alone. 
that subject would have been pretty irrelevant to their audiences. So in this case, the team asked the agencies to focus on its PR and content strategy, which applied more to their audience. They achieved additional visibility by distributing through partners with strong social media presence. According to Ebbs, the campaign was a huge success. Uh, traffic increased 518% compared to the same period the previous year. The report generated numerous third-party blog posts and press mentions. Additionally, the report's landing page had a 16% lower bounce rate than the site's average. Okay. So uh, that's it for the case study. And I think Jen is going to walk you through some of the tactics that you can use to, on your own content marketing campaign. Great. Thanks, Tony. Uh, sure. So we can move on. We can move on. And guys, I'm still going to need you to advance the slides for me. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so let's look at some key strategies for developing valuable in-demand content like Suitcase.com was able to do. So delivering the message with high quality content. What we're looking here at this slide is the best practices in developing content as surveyed in our B2B Marketing Benchmark Survey. So repurposing and reformatting existing content has been rated as our number one tactic. Um, something I hear all the time in our workshops is, you know, that's great. We know we need content. We want to do content, but we don't have the time. You know, it's so hard to produce all of this content. It takes so much time. But you know, most marketers have a library of content that has been developed over the years of case studies, PowerPoint presentations. Your sales team might have PowerPoint presentations. All of this content has really, most of the time, only reached a small portion of the target audience. So it's a great practice to repurpose, reformat, and reuse this existing content to reach new audiences and convert them. And so some ideas that you could take a PDF and you know make that available as a download. Or you could create slides out of that PDF, which is basically the same content. You could put that up on SlideShare. Um, then you could record a voiceover and put that up as a video on YouTube. So then you've got multiple uses for that one original PDF that you had. So think about repurposing this content, reformatting it, and using it to convert and, and resonate with new audiences. Of course, encouraging customers to submit testimonials and case studies. Um, this is a great crowdsourcing technique. Really getting those brand advocates online to speak up and talk for you and produce that content for you, that's been rated as a highly effective tactic as well. Um, something that can be useful but can be difficult sometimes is recruiting authors internally from other departments. I think we've all probably struggled with this a little bit. Um, but if you can get that buy-in, it can be a really effective tactic. Um, we had one case study that um, Marketing Sharpa talked to where a company worked with their sales team. And they, they got buy-in from the top down, which was a critical strategy in getting these authors to contribute. But they were also working with their sales team. And they were able to identify you know, their sales team was really competitive, so they were able to make it sort of like a challenge, a competition, which, you know, their sales team really thrived on. And the best blog post each month would be included in the newsletter. So the sales team were really motivated, and they wanted to start getting that best blog post. So anyway, you have to think of those strategies to recruit authors internally from other departments. Also, outsourcing to an agency, you know, this is coming in further down on the list, but don't shy away from this tactic because it can be highly effective. You just have to find the right fit in your agency. That could be, it could be challenging to find the right agency, but once you do find the right third party to develop your content, it can be highly effective and a huge time saver for you guys. And of course, social media is very effective in producing content as well and finding those brand advocates. So let's take a look on the next few slides. I'm going to be covering the new rules of content development. So the first step is to do the research. You have to identify what types of content is in demand from your audience what, in order to convert them, in order to find out what's going to resonate with them. Again, we've taken the first step in identifying buyer personas, but now we're going to have to dig deeper to identify what subject matter will be interesting and valuable to our personas. Uh, what topics do they actually want to learn about? Again, we want to ask them these questions. Another interesting opportunity is looking at a way to fill a void. So if you can find a topic that's in demand from your market or one of your personas, um, 
and there's not really anyone publishing content about that subject, you can fill that void and truly position yourself as a thought leader. That's how you really do that. Um, what language is our audience using in their discussions to talk about our project or service? And how can we use that language to speak to them and convert them? Are they speaking in a very formal manner, or is it informal or relaxed like a blog post? And again, what formats do they prefer? Um, we, we talked about earlier how you can take one format and then repurpose it and reuse it as multiple different formats. But which format is really going to resonate the best? What, do they prefer articles? Does our audience prefer videos or podcasts? So you have to take that preference into mind too as well. So let's look here at the next slide, looking at thorough research leading to engaging content. So we talk about this research. Where can we really find this information? Well, one tip, of course, of course you want to go straight to the source. You want to do the tactics we've already talked about. But another tip is that using search engines and social media sites can also be really helpful to you. Um, all of the major search engines have keyword research tools that you can use that, that will show you, you know, various keywords, various subjects that are popular in the search engine. So which ones are getting the most searches per month. That can be really helpful. You can also use social media monitoring sites. Um, I know there's free monitoring solutions. There's paid monitoring solutions. Um, check both out. You, know, you can use these to identify what subjects are popular, um, what's getting shared, what's really going viral on social media sites, and that can help you drive your content decisions. But on the next slide here, I have an important concept I want you guys to, to remember. You want to balance this research with innovation for your content development. So I have a quote here from Henry Ford, and it says, if I had asked what my customers wanted, I would have made a faster horse. So what we're talking about here is really this concept um, where you you know your product better than anybody else, and you know the goals of your company better than anybody else. So you, you want to balance this knowledge that you have with the research that you've identified on your audience um, with what they have indicated that they wanted or what you have learned they wanted through your research. You make sure you balance your own creativity and your own innovation with that. So some content development can come internally. Um, that's not a problem. You know, even if you have you know, a salesperson or your CEO saying, hey, I have this great content idea, it's, your first reaction isn't, no, well, that didn't come from our audience. You, know, you have to consider these ideas because internally you guys are the ones who know your products the best, who know what's going on in the company, um, who know the market probably better than your target audience does. So use this knowledge, use this creativity to really drive your content decisions. And of course balance it with your research. So let's look at the next slide here. We have uh, the new rules of content development, which is personalization. So here we have a chart, and this shows the level of personalization the vast majority of our survey respondents who are marketers are applying to their content. So we have 40% who indicated that they're regularly personalizing the messaging of their marketing materials. And this is really covering all materials. It's covering um, their demand generation materials, their, you know, their direct mail, their email, whatever content they're sending out there. It's also their um, funnel optimization materials, their lead nurturing emails, or any other nurturing content that's going out there. Uh, we also have 41% indicating that they tend to personalize messaging from time to time, but not on a regular basis. So between these two options, we have 81% indicating that they're applying some level of personalization to their marketing materials. And then, of course, only 19% have indicated that they don't personalize any of their marketing materials. So that's a big loss there. You know, you can't skip this step. As you can see, the majority of marketers are applying some level of personalization to their marketing materials. Um, and if you don't do this, that 19%, I hate to say it, but you're really risking looking unsophisticated to your market because so many people are personalizing and they're giving that personal touch. So you want to make sure that you're doing this as well. Another thing I want you to think about is taking this concept of personalization and applying it at a larger scale. So not just you know, personalizing the actual content of the material, but let's personalize by thinking about um, segmenting our content. Let's personalize um, to our buyer personas. That way, when we segment our content, we develop 
multiple tracks from multiple different personas, this is going to make that content highly relevant to those individuals. Again, we're not sending that one message out anymore to that wide and varied audience because that's not going to do the trick for you. That's not going to be effective. You're going to want to segment the delivery of very targeted, very niche content out to your very targeted and niche buyer personas that we've identified in the first step here in this webinar. So let's look at the next new rule of content development, which is you can't make the grade without a good test. So in marketing, we're constantly testing lead generation campaigns, landing pages, calls to action. We're so used to this. We're constantly optimizing all these different materials to get a better conversion rate, um, to get a lower cost per lead and a lower cost per acquisition. So in marketing, we're used to testing. But what we've seen is that something that doesn't very often get tested is this content piece. Um, you know, Right now, it's sort of the content gets generated and it gets put out there, and then the landing page that the content is downloaded from, that's tested and optimized. But why don't we test and optimize the content itself? You know, the reason why the suitcase.com case study, why that content was so effective, is because they did the research and because they made it so highly targeted and they got that subject matter that was in high demand and that no one else was really publishing. Um, so they were able to establish that thought leadership. So let's pay a little more attention to our content here. Let's test things like actual subject matter. Um, what subject matter is going to resonate with our audience? What they're actually looking to learn about now? Uh, another thing that you could do that can be really um, helpful is piggybacking on anything that has been happening in the industry, any news any industry-related news that's happened. You know, sometimes if you can catch that train, that subject matter can really go viral and can really resonate very well. Um, what format, again, we've talked a little bit about this, but you want to think about does your audience, you can attest your PDF versus your video, um, your PowerPoint presentation versus your white paper, and see which really is generating more conversions, a higher conversion rate, um, a lower cost per acquisition, a lead that moves through the funnel more quickly. These are all things that you want to look at. And again, your style, is it formal, is it informal? Do we have a long piece of content or is it short? You know, if you're looking at a video that's longer than five minutes, how many people are actually watching that entire video? Um, or you know, another thing you can think about there is quality. Those leads that do watch the entire video, are they a better quality lead? Are they converting more down the line? Uh, readability. This is something that's very important. You know, with search engine optimization, we can sometimes get stuck into writing content for the search engines and not so much for the audience. This is a big challenge that I see out in our workshops all the time. I always get questions about this. Um, you want to make sure that as much as you're optimizing your content, there's really no there's no point in having this content so well optimized and so searchable and so findable if it's not written for your audience and if it's not good content for your audience. So what I'm saying is what's the use of optimizing this content for the search engines and having your audience find them, but it's not really good content for them. So it will get listed. It will get indexed, right, because you're doing your title tags, you're optimizing all your keywords and everything, but it's not actually good content that's readable um, that's in a good subject matter. So make sure you're testing that and thinking about that too because I know search engine optimization is such a big tactic now. Let's also think about testing the timing of the distribution. Um, here at Marketing Sharper, we're always testing timing of everything from the timing of webinars like this, when to have them, what day of week to have them. Um, and my, our marketing team has been able to identify effective times. So think about the timing and distribution of your content and anything that you're sending out. You know, if you send your nurturing email out or your demand generation email out, um, first thing in the morning versus in the afternoon, which one is resonating more, which one um, are your, is your audience interacting with more, they're opening, they're clicking through, they're converting, and then they're moving through the funnel. Um, and also, always something to look at, not just conversion rate, not just volume, what is the quality? You know, what is, what leads are actually going through to the sales team and moving through the funnel? Um, subject line titles, of course, we're used to testing these. These are still important to test. Same thing, same goes for calls to action. So let's really wrap our head around this concept of testing our content to really optimize it and really help it resonate and convert. Here I have a, on the next slide, I have another template for you guys to use. Of course, I mentioned you are going to get a copy of these slides. 
what we saw earlier is that the top tactic in content development was repurposing and reformatting existing content. So what you can do here is use this template to really sort of take inventory of the content that you have in-house already. Is it a case study? Is it a PowerPoint? Is it a white paper? Whatever you have. And then you want to follow the golden rule of, you know, does this meet our audience preferences? You don't want to put out content that you had that's old but it's ineffective just because you have it. You want to make sure you're, you're screening all of it as well. So on the next slide here, we're looking at research topics. Um, and looking at, I'm sorry, rather, we're going to look at homegrown content versus third-party content here on this grid. So one thing that we've talked about, we've talked about a lot of tactics about developing your content in-house, right? And, most marketers do this this way, but I want you guys to consider using a third party for your content because this can be highly effective. It can be a little bit more difficult to set up on the front end, but once you get it going, it can be a highly effective tactic for your content. So let's look here on this slide at some of the benefits and some of the challenges of both homegrown and third party content. Usually your homegrown content is inexpensive. Now, I know time is money, and that's something we talk about a lot in our workshops, but you're not actually cutting a check for your homegrown content per se, unless, of course, you have an individual that's 100% devoted to content in-house. But most times, the homegrown content is perceived as inexpensive, where the third-party content, you're cutting a check, you're having this come out of your marketing budget, you have to make room for it. Your homegrown content, because you're making it in-house, it's going to be highly specific. Um, this is often a challenge, especially for the software industry. You guys know your features. You know uh, what's going on there so much more than a third party would. So you can be a lot more specific there. Your third party is going to be a little bit more broad in this content. Your homegrown content, of course, you control every word that's written and put out in this content. But your third-party content, you lose a little bit of that control. And you give that up to get the benefit of the time. Uh, your content can be pulled down, any content that you put up on your website. If you decide it's old or bad or you don't want it out there, or things have changed, you can pull it down. But your third-party content often is going to live forever. So you want to be careful about what you're doing there. Your homegrown content, again, um, we're looking at the specificity here. It's technically accurate, whereas the third party, you're losing a little bit of that specificity, um, and it could possibly be inaccurate at times. So that's a big concern to look out for there. Let's look at some of the benefits here now, though, of the third party content. Um, as we mentioned with the uh, growth of social media sites, you know, the, any, any word coming directly from the company is not going to be trusted or as valued as word coming from the third party or a peer or any other party other than the company itself. So your homegrown content is going to have a lower value to the reader because of this, and your third party content is going to have a higher perceived value um, just because of what's going on out there. And now the homegrown content is kind of seen more as a sales job, whereas your third party content is going to serve as an endorsement for you. So even if it's just plain thought leadership content, our buyers are getting smarter and they're a little bit more quick to the fact that this thought, even though it's thought leadership, it's still coming directly from us. So it may still be perceived as a sales job. So you have to be careful with that. But the third party content is seen as a true endorsement. So we're going to get ready. We're going to have plenty of time for questions for you guys today. We, we got a lot pre-webinar based on the registrations, and we're also happy to address any questions that have come up during the presentation. So you guys start thinking about that and send your questions in through the chat, and we'll address them in a minute. But first I'm going to cover our wrap-up and key takeaways. So today we really covered our fuel methodology for B2B marketing effectiveness. We really focused on the top of the funnel today and the first step of finding and attracting leads. We built our foundation for our lead generation programs. We looked at the importance of buyer personas and how to go about developing them. Again, it's so important to have these buyer personas now because our buyers are expecting more and we have to deliver. We have to deliver by giving them relevant, valuable, in-demand content. So by identifying identifying those buyer personas, learning about them, segmenting our content out to them, that's really going to help you achieve this. So, so important to do nowadays. Um, so also included in the first step of the fuel methodology is mastering that essential lead generation and really getting that demand generation in check. 
Again, looking at once you get these leads, um, you're going to want to do the rest of the fuel methodology. You're going to need to uncover them. You're going to need to score your leads and nurture your leads. As we saw, there's a huge opportunity right now for you to get ahead because the majority of the market are not adopting these best practices. So let's use this time now to get ahead of the competition, start scoring and nurturing our leads so that we can scoop up those leads that may have registered with the competitors as well because we're scoring and they're not. Again, because we're nurturing and they're not because we're using buyer personas and they're not. So let's take advantage of this unique time, this unique opportunity to really get ahead and really scoop up those leads that could be going to the competition. Um, again, think about establishing automated processes for your lead generation. Um, once you get into intricate scoring and nurturing campaigns, it's going to be difficult if not impossible for you to execute them on a human manner. So that's why we really recommend this automation. And of course, lift results. So we talked about this with our content. You want to make sure that you're testing your content, you're optimizing your content, you're testing your various subject points. And you're going to want to test everything in your funnel. Test different lead generation tactics. Test different nurturing and scoring tactics. We always want to have a culture of optimization in our organization. So that's all we have for today in terms of the presentation. We're going to have plenty of time for questions, and I'd like to hand it back to Justin in order to start getting those going. Oh, thanks, Jen. Thank you, Stoney, as well. And you know, now before we get to those questions, you know, many of you have asked how you can improve your lead gen marketing process. And as I mentioned earlier on, ActOn is our sponsor today, and they provide an intuitive and really easy to use marketing automation platform that's really built for companies of every size. So take a look at the screen that you've got in front of you now. If you're looking, you know, for great assets on how marketers can help and get help from what they're looking for, you can get a complete set of tools in one platform, whether it's social email, search, or your lead nurturing efforts. And so they really have a start simple approach that really can be tailored to any marketer's needs. So I highly encourage you to visit acton.com and you can watch a free demo uh, on how that this platform is really easy to use. I highly recommend that. Also, based on the content that we've heard today, uh, the 2012 Lead Generation Benchmark Report, uh, Jen was the lead author of this, and there's a lot of great content in here, some of which we covered today. It's got over 50 answers, uh, most challenging questions, thousands of marketers were surveyed. I highly encourage you to uh, take advantage of this by saving $100 and using that link below. By using that promo code, uh, you can get that savings right away. Okay, so we've got a lot of questions. Uh, just I'll throw these out for Jen or Stone. Any one of you guys can answer these questions. The first is from Joanne, and she wants to know, what's your take on requiring web visitors to register, register or fill out a form to get content? How do you guys feel about that? Yeah, it depends on your campaign. Um, let's think about this. So requiring that registration, this can be effective. Of course, you need that for your lead generation, right? This can also be effective when you're looking at your nurturing um, as part of a, a conversion nurturing campaign or getting more information. So say your lead has converted already on a previous campaign. You need to learn more about them. They're not going through to sales yet. You can use this as part of a campaign to send out a new piece of valuable content to them, send them to a new landing page, and ask more questions and learn more information about them. So that's a great tactic there. Um, of course, you're going to need to give some information, some content out there for free um, in order to build that trust pre-conversion. Again, trust is a huge issue out there now because of the economy, because of those external influencers we talked about with social media as well. And you know, so it's very important. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, one of the things we've tested here at Mech Labs and we're constantly trying to review and, and make important is, it, you know, what's the tipping point, right? So when someone comes to a page and they see that there's automatically a form, what I found is that a lot of companies, you know, they have a few things like they don't really point out the value of what the free excerpt or the free report is or even the, the content itself. So I think really promoting and, and showing the value highlight the reason of why I need to put my information in, you know. Make sure there's a good value exchange there. I would also add on to that. Absolutely. Right, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I think a lot of it's yeah, I think a lot of it's about testing too. I mean you, you want to test your value proposition, but you can also test the form. Um, so I think a multi step form is a really proactive way to re reduce the number of fields so you attract more people. And you know, if if you lose people after that that first um, after the first email 
fill out an uh, email field, then, then you still have information and you can do a lead nurturing campaign. Yeah, that's, that, those are all great tips. Uh, the next question is from Ben. He says, as we look at a variety of our buying personas, how do we refrain from trying to be everything to everyone? And I know this is a big issue with a lot of companies. It absolutely is. You can't be everything to everybody, so don't try. <laughs> that's exactly why uh, we need to develop these buyer personas. Um, if you're worried about still being relevant and still resonating with that buyer persona after you've identified your four personas, dig deeper and you might have more personas that you need to uncover there. You might have quadrants for each industry. Um, you might have quadrants for each organization size. You can really get into this on a really intricate level and that will enable you to really segment your content out. Again, think smaller. Um, instead of bigger here, um, you want to target a smaller group of individuals who have um, common goals, common demographics, common interests, um, other commonalities. As niche as you can get with that, the better your content is going to be and the better it's going to resonate with that audience. So this can be a great undertaking, right? Thinking about all of these buyer personas that you have to develop for all of your industry verticals and all of your products. Oh my goodness, there's so much to do. Again, start small. Um, we're thinking small. We're going to start small and end big. So start with your primary quadrant. And then once you've got that going, you know, some segmentation is better than none at all. So if you're you know, spending all of this time and spinning your wheels developing all of this segmentation, but you're not actually segmenting your content yet while you're doing this plan, um, you could have been segmenting all along. And that could have been really helping to get that content out there and really get those conversions in. And again, thinking about our previous question, when we're looking at getting those conversions, it's not all about volume anymore. It's not all about just optimizing for the best volume. You have to look at the quality of leads coming in too. So if you're segmenting out your delivery of your content, you've got this landing page and you're trying to just get this many conversions on there and you, you minimize it down to two fields, name and email, and that's all you want, yeah, you're going to get more leads converting on that. But you have to look at that down the funnel as well. You know, how many of those leads are actually qualified? How many of those leads are going over to sales, turning into sales opportunities, and moving through the funnel? So that's another big piece here that we have to think about. It's not just about that volume. You want to make sure you're thinking small, going out to your niche buyer personas, but then considering quality. So just because you're getting less conversions, if those few conversions that you get are buying and they're, they're giving you a really good ROI, that's more successful than spinning your wheels, getting all these unqualified conversions that down the road is just going to waste sales time. Um, so you have to think about these things too. Perfect. And got a couple more questions here. I know we have got time for a few. Uh, this question comes from Scott. He says, when writing for clients, what is the best strategy to ensure you understand the most effective keywords? Stoney, Jen, do you guys have any comments on that? Yeah, absolutely. So this is Touching on you know writing for the search engines versus writing for your clients, right? You do want to get the right keywords that have volume of searches because you do want to get that volume coming to your site, but you have to make sure that it's relevant. Again, that's balancing that quality versus quantity issue there. Um, and the best tactic really is going to the source, Scott. You know, you have to talk to your leads. You have to talk to your audience, talk to your prospects and customers. They're going to tell you what they're looking for. They're going to tell you what subject matter they want, um, what topics you're interested in, what news items, industry-related news they're interested in. And that's going to help drive that quality factor. And then you can balance that perhaps with a couple of high volume keywords if they didn't mention them, but you want to keep that balance going. Again, think about your company's goals, but that's the biggest challenge out there right now, balancing for quality and quantity. Yeah, that's perfect, Jenny. You know, one, that kind of goes into my next question with Lola. She says, once the lead is provided to the sales rep, how do you keep sight of it? She says, as marketers with resource constraints, we don't have the time to break down and nurture every lead. We already have moved on to the next campaign. And I can honestly say that's, that's a lot of truth to that, right? We, as marketers, we run out of time. We're looking for resources. I think that's where marketing automation may come in. What, what do you guys feel about that? Yeah, Justin, we totally would recommend automation, that solution. Um, you know, that's why automation is part of the field methodology. Now, 
Automation can be expensive. It can be difficult to implement. There's a lot of challenges that come with this automation. Um, but you don't have to – I've talked to a lot of marketers in our workshops, and you know, they say, yeah, yeah, it's, it's great to have the automation. It's great to do all of the, these nurturing checks. I don't have the time for all of that. And that's certainly a very relevant, very common challenge that's going on out there. So you're definitely not alone. But you can think about automation in other ways. If you can't go to a full blown out automation solution off the bat, think about automation with your CRM. Um, a lot of CRM tools, whether it's Salesforce or Microsoft, whatever you've got in house, think about what sort of automated features they have that you can utilize. Um, your email system usually will have some automated solutions that you can use there, whether it's scheduling emails or you know, running reports to go out to emails, things like that can be automated. And like everything, um, I think there's a general theme in what I've been talking about here is start small and big. So with your nurturing, it can be really overwhelming to think about all – so say you've got a three-month sales cycle. You've got to hit them twice a month, and you've got several segments. I mean, the emails are quickly adding up there, right? But if you start small and start with a, a campaign that's just going out to everybody, again, that's not the best practice for your nurturing. But while you're developing your best practice nurturing path, you could have some nurturing going on out there, which is way more effective than doing nothing. Even if it isn't segmented off the bat, um, you want to obviously work towards that best practice. That's your goal. But if you start small, you can start getting some benefit there, and then you can continually improve upon and optimize your nurturing track. Like add a couple emails per month. That's doable. That's manageable. And then over time you'll get there and you'll have that advanced nurturing track and strategy in place that will really um, be turning out those qualified leads for you. Yeah, those are good points. Our last question that we have time, this is Joanne St. Andrew, and she says, what is, the, you know, what is the best nurturing? How do you balance selling your product or service versus provide useful information? She says, do you suggest making your company the most knowledgeable versus this is our product? And I think, Jen, you and I have even talked about this personally, the balance, right? There's always a hard balance between, you know, what, what as the role of the organization, you know, we don't want to sound salesy. We don't want to sound like we're coming across to sell. We want to sound knowledgeable. Have you found anything as far as like the best way to balance that or any methodology on that? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with producing sales content that's going to convert your leads and talk about the benefits of your product. We need to have that type of content out there. But what you have to consider is the stage of the buying cycle that you're sending that content out to, right? So if they're very early stages, they're probably not thinking, especially if you have a complex sale, you have a longer sales cycle, those early stage leads aren't thinking about conversion just yet. So early in the funnel, that's where you want to keep it, you know, mostly on thought leadership. Really give them content that's valuable to them, that's not so salesy, that's getting them to trust you, that's getting them involved in the process, getting them familiar with you. Um, and then once they move through the funnel a little bit more, maybe once they go to sales, maybe um, once a certain time period has passed, however you determine it's going to be effective for you, then you start hitting them with the sales content. Then you start hitting them with the conversion materials like the buyer's guides, um, the ROI calculators, the sales materials, the white papers, the data sheets. That's when you start hitting them later on the sales in the sales cycle. So think about timing there when you're balancing your thought leadership versus your self-promotional content. And again, think about that third-party content again too, you know, because that can be perceived as an endorsement versus a sales job if you're worried about that. And that can give you some endorsement at the top of the funnel as well without having it sound too salesy. That's, that's perfect. Yeah, well, thank you. thank you again to everyone, including our speakers, you know, for being on this call. We know your time is precious. And just a reminder, all these slides, including everything here, will be sent to you after uh, this webinar is concluded. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a great and wonderful day.